this is a webinar where I can't actually see you. Uh, I, I'm seeing myself, but I have this sense. Uh, it's a little like, um, I don't know, my life as a child where I had a very strong imagination. And sometimes I imagined that I was having conversations with people alone in my room. So I'm in my basement right now. And uh, these conversations were so rich because in my imagination, I could imagine people responding to me. So it's a little bit like this today uh, in the webinar format because uh, I have a sense you're there and I'm imagining you being there. Uh, but in fact, I can't see you. So um, feel free if you wish to interject anything at any time uh, during this evening's discussion to either, as Ryan said, put it in the chat or uh, feel free to unmute yourself and um, just say, Meg, I, I want to think more about this. Uh, I always love that kind of engagement. So I'm actually going to start uh, before I take you on this journey of the question are we the people up for climate change? Uh, I'm curious what you all think. I've taken this discussion, this presentation to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, taken it through Zoom to Moravian University students. And I asked them the question, are we the people up for the task of dealing with climate change? And I framed it as a yes or no question. I don't think that's such a great idea because um, as you can imagine, uh, the answer was pretty resounding, no. Uh, no, we the people are not up for climate change. What was the evidence? Well, uh, your generation has spent a lot of time thinking about climate change and not doing anything. So uh, we don't think the, the whole idea of democracy and we the people is gonna work. In fact, one student said, maybe if we just let the young people I was asking her, what was the cutoff? Was it 30? Was it 35? Could you get up to 40? And only people under that age, they should be able to uh, deal with climate change because our generation, I'm speaking for myself as a boomer uh, and people uh, um, older than me, a little bit younger than me, we were not credible as uh, democratic actors who could actually deal with this. So I decided for tonight's talk, because I'll tell you quite honestly, I set this as a question and I really hoped I could come up with a convincing argument for why we the people is worth believing in to deal with something as urgent and as much as, as a crisis as climate change. Um, so I, I had to spend a lot of dark moments in my soul because I also, saw reasons to say, no, it's not, we can't do it. There's no evidence. Um, and luckily I, I don't end there. So I, I've, I'm hoping that I will come up with a strategy for dealing with this question. So it's not a yes or no, but a pathway of potential. So now I'm gonna frame the question, not as a yes or no question, but what would it look like if we the people were up for climate change. So go ahead and put that in chat or unmute yourself and say what you think. But I'm curious, what would it look like if we the people were up for the urgency of climate change? So I'll just give you a few moments to put something in chat or to unmute yourself, or just to contemplate. Uh, I've gotten one, I don't see evidence in Congress among the people who talk the most. So um, right there we have, that's not a very good, that's not evidence for we the people can do it. Um, so I know I've asked you a very hard question. What would it look like if we the people could deal with climate change? So Bob's given us something and it's, it's because he anticipates the other side of the question. What would it look like if we the people aren't up for the challenge of climate change? Uh, here we have from Alison Mott, 
people volunteer and work together in times of emergency. That's a good vision of what it would look like if people were working together, we the people. So volunteering in times of emergency. Uh, we would be driving electric vehicles. That would be another one. Uh, and that's from Cheryl, thank you. So we would be driving electric vehicles. I'm gonna write that down. Another one is we would be volunteering. And it's almost as if the situation itself would draw us to it. Um, let's see if I see any others. Oh, this is lovely. We would be teaching about the causes and effects in schools. So there would be a big educational campaign, uh, which is very nice. I like it when people come up with education as a means of changing people's hearts and minds as opposed to coercive force which is another option. Uh, and uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful to China, uh, which is that, but they are able to make all sorts of changes and they, uh, can, they can just do it through the will of the government. Uh, we would have to be mentored by a number of people whom we agree are trustworthy and open to a lot of ideas. So this is a beautiful thing that Bob is saying uh, about being open to uh, listening, but it's interesting what you say, Bob, is people whom we agree are trustworthy. Trust is going to be a big piece here. I'm going to put that in pink to indicate how important it is. Uh, okay. And our corporate behemoth, says Richard, would begin collaborating and putting climate change before profits on many levels. So there would be uh, a sense of the m major economic interests. And I'll just make it, I do it as skyscrapers, but that these people would have to put something above money because money, if that's the uh, highest value, that's gonna be a problem. So uh, putting climate change before promise, profit, says Richard. And Walter says, every family has an edible garden. I love this. Okay, so we've got some little plants here uh, growing and that you have food. My pictures are terrible, but these are my little plants and they're done with green. Uh, with this understanding that people are taking care of themselves. There would be a bipartisan task force, says Joanna, to work on this. And every state would be tasked with coming up with plans. There would be demands for every department to decrease energy usage. And there would be departments dedicated to developing the technology. I love this, Joanna, because first of all, you're saying it's bipartisan. So this, uh, Bob, take notice. Uh, bipartisan suggests you may be working with people that you're not sure is trustworthy. Uh, and yet there would be very specific goals here to decrease energy usage and developing technology. Uh, great, okay, so this gets us some idea on what it would look like were we the people to really take this on and increase investments in alternative energy initiatives as Richard and educational targets for improving climate change awareness. So Richard is also agreeing with this idea that uh, education is going to be key. key. Um, and then Marquetta, these are beautiful. There would be trust among people. Wow. There would be trust among people. For we the people to actually do this, we would have to have trust. And it's not just trust some people, we have to trust each other. All containers would be recyclable, says Cheryl. We would institute carbon credits, right? Tax reasons. Um, okay, this is fabulous. Thank you so much. We've got lots out here. Feel free to keep going. I'm gonna move on to the next dark side though. What would it look like if we the people are not, are not up to this task? What could you imagine it would look like? So I'll give you a, a moment to think about that. Although Bob did say um, it might look like Congress that can't do anything. All right, let's see, we've got what we have now, says Cheryl, what we have now, that's what it would look like. Um, 
media consortium would, with advisors, prepare a series of succinct explanations on video of the ecosystem and weather systems and how they work. Action points would be shared in many public service announcements. I love all these ideas. They're so specific. Uh, I was once told by a marriage counselor, if you want to improve your relationship, you should use positive, specific, attainable goals. And um, so what Marnie has put in the chat, so that's on the, that first side. But the dark side would be, um, my well ran out of water this summer, third time in six years. Yeah, what would it look like? Running out of water. No flood insurance, says Walter. Much worse and more dire, especially bad in poorer countries, says Joanna. Short-term focus on future and mostly on economic outcomes. SMART acronym. What is SMART acronym? George has weighed in on this other side of like, what, what would it look like if the people can do it? Gardens would become more popular, also hunting and fishing. So not only are we um, going to be growing our food, we're going to go into the deep forest with whatever it takes in order to bring in meat. So um, the, the, I, th there's definitely a vision of what we can do. A lot of it appears to be local. Um, and local action, self-sufficiency. All right. So what I'm going to do now, because this gets us going, thinking about what the task is in front of us, um, knowing that, as Susan just put in chat, continued extreme weather patterns resulting in disasters, that that's the other side of climate change. So this is not an academic question. Um, I have been talking about the Constitution since the 2016 election with an idea of wanting to bring people together to talk about uh, founding documents and see them as uh, a place that we can find common ground, even though we may have very different points of view. And that is a wonderful activity, but it can feel a little dissonant to talk about constitutional issues when, as Susan Crowther just said, continued extreme weather patterns resulting in disasters. Do we have the time to consider these democratic uh, methods? And as we have to deal with worse, um, worse um, situations, will it make it harder for us to work together? And thank you, George Putnam, uh, for saying what SMART stands for, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and, um, oops, now I've lost it again, uh, relevant and time-based. So the, if we wish to make suggestions for each other, the more specific we can be, the more measures, more we're able to measure, measure data, uh, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Uh, great, okay. So now I am going to share my screen with you. Uh, and we're going to look at the preamble, like where did this language come from? We the people. And then I want to take us through some ideas of what does it mean to be a member of a we the people? Um, and, and then I'll come up with four different ways of considering we the people. And we'll take a look at each one. Um, and I'm going to make a big push for number four, but I don't want to give away too much earlier, too early. So let's start with this thing that we can do. So we the people, here it is, big letters, uh, beautifully drafted on the constitution. And what is the language? We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, so not a perfect union, a more perfect union, established justice, and I've um, capitalized any word that appears as it appears in the Constitution. So justice, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do establish and do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. So it's one sentence. 
And uh, it's a powerful sentence. Uh, the constitution of states oftentimes began with language of this sort, we the people. In Pennsylvania, I found out, it begins by, uh, by the people and by the powers of the creator. So in the constitution, they take out the creator, God, and they insert the people. It's an important beginning to this political uh, experiment of the United States. It's a collective noun as well. And, and I really wanna stress that it's not the persons, it's not the individuals, it's we the people, which is a uh, making one out of many. And um, so for a very individualized nation, the whole thing begins with this collective noun. The other thing I wanna draw your attention to is those words that are in capital, union, justice, tranquility, welfare, and blessings of liberty. These are all shared goals, shared values. Um, and this is another thing I really want to stress because sometimes in the United States, there's so much emphasis on process, on each person making up their own minds about what matters, which is a very important element in the United States. And yet at the same time, the animating force is a collective. So blessings of liberty, and we might think of that as getting on the level of individual rights, uh, particularly property rights, but also free speech, uh, freedom of religion, and others that were eventually set forth in the Bill of Rights. But this idea that we begin with a shared vision of what we want, common goals, uh, is very important to understanding what we the people is. Um, so there's four different ways, as I mentioned, to think about who are we the people? Well, one is to think of it as an assembly of political actors. And the place where that would happen would be a town hall or Congress, um, any deliberative space where people come together to discuss public matters. So that's number one, the political understanding of we the people. The second way of understanding we the people is as an aggregation of economic actors. Uh, and there's been a long tradition of understanding us in that way as well. So. Um, if we go back to uh, an assembly of political actors, that goes back to Aristotle. But understanding we the people in economic terms uh, could go back to Adam Smith and people who understood markets as, as providing a way to distribute decision-making. So markets, if they are acting in a somewhat moral way, if I'm going back to Adam Smith, it allows for individuals to decide for themselves what it is they need to do. Um, so that's the second way of understanding. The th oops, the third way is a militia of revolutionary actors. And that's key for the United States, the battlefield, because the first time we hear we the people or the rights of the people, it's in the Declaration of Independence, and it has to do with altering or abolishing the government. So we the people, that collective right has a revolutionary component. And finally, and the one I'm really gonna hang out with this evening is a web of moral actors. And so I see that as happening within an ecosystem. So the fact that you guys are talking about gardens and forests uh, I, is absolutely right. So let me take each one of these, one, two, three, four. Uh, Going back to Aristotle, he made the claim, man is by nature a political animal. The reason that we are by nature political animals is that we have language, which means we can try and persuade each other. And we will also have different ideas on how things should be done. And it's because of that diversity and also our ability to persuade one another um, that Aristotle saw politics as a humanizing force. It's uh, the opportunity for noble action is what happens when we engage in politics. Um, and here's a, a passage that I pulled from Michael Oakeshott, who's often understood as a 
a conservative, but he's he really nails in this sentence the idea that uh, politics is about it's, it's some of that smart that people were talking about. Political discourse diagnoses the situation. It makes a proposal about what the response to it should be. It recommends this proposal by considering a large number of consequences likely to follow from acting upon it. And I know there was something in chat that wanted us to understand cause and effect. So part of political discourse is to anticipate and imagine consequences. It balances the merit of this proposal against those of at least one other proposal. And that's another key thing for decision-making. You don't want just one proposal, yay or nay, you really want uh, the deliberative body to consider options, alternatives, and it assumes agreement about the general conditions of things to be preferred. This idea about general conditions of things, those are those terms that we have in the first line of the, in the preamble, welfare, justice, tranquility, um, and others. So these are just a picture of, I'm sorry, uh, some statements to give you a sense of what to be a homo politicus is what Aristotle would have said, a political actor. Uh, that's what that looks like. And we do that regularly in Vermont. Here's a picture from Putney Town Meeting, which is uh, the town I live in. And people are making lots of decisions, uh, asking questions, thinking about the consequences of uh, an article that's on the warrant. So that's number one, the political. Number two is economic. Uh, so I pulled out a passage from Milton Friedman, who um, is a very influential economist, particularly uh, beginning with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And he's made the claim, the role of the market permits unanimity without conformity. So when you have unanimity, it's not because everybody was forced into an agreement. The market allows um, unanimity without conformity. It is a system of effectively proportional representation. Uh, he wrote this in 1962 in his book, Capitalism and Freedom. And you could say this is what it looks like. Uh, here's a farmer's market in Maryland. Um, and the idea that somebody decides to come in here, uh, they decide to which of the stalls they're going to go to. It's a way of making sure that people make their own choices and do not get coerced. The third way that we can think about um, the, the right of the people, and I just gave a talk in Springfield on the second amendment, and this one, they totally understood. The gun owners of Vermont showed up. They were concerned that a college professor would say something anti-gun. Um, but I am, uh, I see the people's right to revolution as, as a basis of our government. So I'm quoting Akil Reed Amar. He's a Yale law professor. In the Declaration of Independence, you have the right of the people and I've capitalized it just as it appeared, to alter or to abolish the government and to institute a new government. Uh, Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And uh, that is language that Akil Reed Amar says is a collective right. He's writing before the recent Supreme Court decisions, 2008, 2010, in which the court said, no, actually the right of the people to keep and bear arms is not a collective right, it is a personal right. Um, so, but this was the argument that uh, um, Amar says. He, uh, he believes that whenever there's this reference to the people's rights in the constitution, that we should be thinking of the collective right to revolution uh, and that the subject of this right is we the people, that's a collective noun, not the states or individuals. So what does that look like? That looks like this, Battle of Your Town. Um, so we have a revolutionary right as well within our understanding of we the people. Um, you, I could, and I won't take a lot of time 
right to do this, but I think a person could make a Marxist argument using this exact same understanding that whenever a class of people, say the workers, are being alienated or exploited, uh, that they should have a collective right to revolution. So that's our third. But I want to spend time thinking about the fourth. And I called that one the moral actor. And I started thinking about this because of a line from Aristotle. And he says, if the people are not utterly degraded, although individually they may be worse judges than those who have special knowledge, as a body, they are as good or better. That's a big claim. Uh, Aristotle says early on that deliberation will get better results than um, uh, elite or technocratic solution. So he was always, because of his basic understanding that politics makes us better human beings, he wanted us to engage in politics. And so this idea is, if you're not utterly degraded, you're gonna come up with better decisions. So that's kind of the question that I started thinking about this question about we the people. If we're not utterly degraded, we should be able to handle this. But then there's that next question, are we degraded or not? Um, a couple other things I just wanna pull out that Aristotle said to help shape this discussion. When men are friends, they have no need of justice. Well, when they are just, they need friendship as well. And one of the people in the chat earlier said, we need trust among people, which means you have to have a sense of like you want to be friends with somebody. You may not agree with them, but you want to be their friend. And that is going to be essential, more essential, says Aristotle, than justice. To a friend, we ought to wish what is good for his sake. Goodship, I'm sorry, goodwill, when it is reciprocal, being friendship. Um, so this is this idea that the moral actor is not just working on political virtues, and, and we'll start to go into what those details are, but a key thing about being a moral actor within we the people is to be open to friendship. In fact, it is to pursue friendship. And for Aristotle, friendship is more important than justice. This is uh, older than Aristotle. Um, this goes back to the Israelites, the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. This was picked up, this basic idea that friendship and not treating one's neighbor badly was going to be key to holding a community together. Um, and so in 1647, this is a very important date in European history, uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism, this would be from the Church of Scotland. This is how they explained what the ninth commandment is. And you might think about it, particularly if you're feeling um, disheartened by the polarization of American politics, that here is a, a way of understanding the ninth commandment, which the Church of Scotland thought this may uh, uh, um, reduce our um, hostility. A charitable esteem of our neighbors, loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good name, sorrowing for and covering of their infirmities, freely acknowledging of their gifts and graces, defending their innocency. And we might think about that in terms of the Bill of Rights too, the emphasis to, um, to um, protect the rights of the accused. Lots of things in the Bill of Rights to uh, work on the presumption of innocence. So here it's reinforced, defending their innocency, a ready receiving of a good report and unwillingness to admit of an evil report concerning them. This is good faith. You have good faith towards your neighbors. Um, 1647, I said, was a big year. It's the year before the 
uh, piece of Westphalia when the 30 year war, and then there was another war, the 80 year war. Anyway, there was enormous wars. They went on forever, civil wars going on in Europe. And um, the, the peace of Westphalia was finally signed in 1648. And I see this as an effort when it's madness in Europe, Protestants are killing Catholics or then killing Protestants. And then there's uh, division within the Protestants and divisions within the Catholics and uh, different um, monarchies are involved in this. And you can just imagine this terrible sense of despair can we get along? And here is an effort to try and reduce polarization. Very simple uh, request, charitable esteem of our neighbors. This also appears in the constitution of Vermont, a sense of the moral uh, necessity of being a, a citizen. So article 16 in the constitution of Vermont from 1777, that frequent recurrence to fundamental principles and a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, industry, and frugality are absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty and keep government free. So when they said in that first sentence in the constitution of 1787, there was already in people's imagination the idea that blessings of liberty are something that were bestowed, that we bestowed upon ourselves, right? Because we are the actors. We are the animating force. That when we practice justice, moderation, temperance, industry, and frugality, that's what's necessary uh, to preserve the blessings of liberty. And in terms of climate change, we can think about this frugality. It's big, moderation, enormous. Temperance, and that doesn't just mean withholding from alcohol. I know the temperance movement, but it's really being in control of your passions, um, having a sense of moderation, of being able to temper yourself. Okay, um, so I've given you a, some sense of some of the background behind this moral understanding of what it means to be a uh, part of we the people. And there's another term I want to bring in, and this comes from Benjamin Franklin. So um, it was always unclear, would they get enough votes to even get the Constitution out of uh, uh, Philadelphia and out to the states for ratification? And it had gotten very animated there in the convention chambers, people deliberating. And when they finally come up with a draft they think is going to be the final one, Benjamin Franklin writes to George Washington, who is presiding over these uh, meetings. I confess that there are several parts of this constitution which I do not at present approve, but I am not sure I shall never approve them. For having lived long, I have experienced many instances of being obliged by better information or fuller consideration to change opinions, even on important subjects, which I once thought right, but found to be otherwise. So I've lived a long time and I know it's not perfect, but I know that sometimes when I'm sure something is wrong, then I find out later that maybe it was right. Um, on the whole, sir, I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the convention who may still have objections to it would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his own infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity. So there's that term again, unanimity of one spirit to put his name to this instrument. Um, so the other term that I wanted to add to our list of virtues for being a moral member of we the people is the idea that we are all infallible and to have a little bit of humility. So uh, Milton Friedman um, was making a strong case and I think he's right in many ways that the markets allow for unanimity without conformity. There's another piece to think about this, which is unanimity through recognizing our fallibility, uh, which I would see as humility. Okay, so there's the constitution. 
I'm reading it in this four level way. I'm wanting us to really think about the fact that to be a member of we the people, there is a concern, have we become too degraded to do this self-governance? And uh, I found a statement, this is from the Massachusetts Ratification um, Congress, the uh, convention, I'm sorry, to ratify the, the constitution and a delegate from Plymouth County. So that's the Eastern part of Massachusetts. And generally at this time, you can say that Eastern part of Massachusetts, there was a lot of money on the seaboard and that came from trade, from marketing. Uh, and there was a lot of farmers and homesteaders out in Western Massachusetts. But here's somebody from Plymouth County on the Eastern side, and he's worried, I think, that the operation of paper money and the practice of privateering, of taking things and making it private, of acquiring private wealth, have produced a gradual decay of morals. As people become more luxurious, they become more incapacitated for governing themselves. So there's that argument. Are we really up for it? Are we more interested in luxury and not willing to do um, frugality. As we all know, it passes in Massachusetts. So I'm curious, um, at this stage, we're thinking about this in terms of if we're moral actors, we can become uh, self-governing. If we're not moral actors, then um, there's not much hope for us. And I'm just curious, before I go into the last little part of this discussion. We are profligate, says Cheryl, rather than frugal, right? So that doesn't look good. Can we actually deal with climate change? Uh, if we see too much profligacy and not enough frugality, that's not great. Uh, or are we too intemperate? Are we interested in friendship? Because Aristotle says that's how we can become better as we the people, risking being friends from each, with each other. I'm just checking to see if there's any other comments at this point. And I, and I realize that we're running towards the end of our hour. But um, so I'm gonna just show you a few more slides, um, recognizing that I come to think of this as spiritual work, that yes, we have lots of hard uh, economic forces, and that came up in the chat before. Um, there seems to be a lot of corporate uh, grandeur of being able to make all sorts of decisions, and the people get left out. So there's many structural forces, I don't want to sound naive at all, uh, that are going to make this difficult. But if we want to restore we the people, then uh, we are we're going to have to take, I think, uh, on this more spiritual path. Joanna says, we already have too many workarounds for people to look out for their own interests. But how about rationing as in a real campaign for everyone to work on the problem? Uh, yeah, Joanna, this point is, there have been times in human history when people ration. Um, 19, I remember the 1970s, even with Jimmy Carter, he would say, put on a sweater, don't turn up your thermostat, drive 50 miles, 55 miles an hour. My father-in-law who owned a BMW was furious with this. Uh, why should he go 50, 55 miles an hour with this beautiful German machine? It's, it's geared to go 70 miles an hour. So that's gonna be a, a, a key problem. Um, Cheryl says, I think we are not aware of the need for critical thinking and rhetoric to be able to argue and consider various alternatives. Cheryl, I so agree with you um, that if the rhetoric is vilifying the opponent, we're not doing a very good job of building up the moral muscles of we the people. Uh, and that doesn't mean, as you point out, Cheryl, critical thinking is going to be key. So it's not uh, a unanimity where everybody just nods and smiles, but really engaging in that political deliberation that uh, Aristotle said is how we become more human. Um, George asked spiritual work like deism. Well, that's a really good question, George. Um, 
And again, it's it sounds like we're not able to unmute people. So I, I always would love to hear more what people are thinking. Um, deism is an element here, I think, given the grammar of that first sentence. We, the people, are acting as if we are God in Genesis, making this new world. Uh, it's not a perfect world. It's a, it's a process world. Um, and yeah, Cheryl's saying, I'm thinking of what Aristotle was talking about and the study of rhetoric and debate, so important. Um, for uh, Aristotle, the practice of rhetoric was a beautiful thing. Ethos, logos, pathos, learn how to argue on ethical grounds, on logical grounds, and on passionate grounds. Barry says, there's the problem of language, justice, tranquility, welfare, the blessings of liberty mean very different things to different people. For some of my neighbors, it means driving cars and four wheelers. Yeah, through the woods to get to, oops, to get to places where they can fire off for entertainment, military grade weapons. Just one example of the problem. Uh, yeah, Barry, so it, it's not as if these words are enough because there's deep, deep, deep disagreements about what they can mean. So here I want to share with you, and I'm very grateful, Barry, for showing that this isn't going to necessarily be easy when the ideas of what the blessings of liberty can mean. And here's where I think climate change may actually help us out. So let me just share a few more pictures. Um, let's go here. Okay, and we go here. And what is this next picture? So this is what it looks like, climate change. This is Katrina. And we have people who, um, my guess is, these are people who may have known each other a little, but had to trust each other. And, um, they, are, they have one man who's standing there leading people out of the waters. This is going back to biblical times. Um, the idea of what makes for a good leader, a good leader is somebody who can lead people out of disaster. So Moses would be one example. Uh, and then we get to the medieval era with St. Thomas Aquinas. The, the understanding of what created a good polity was that there was a pilot of a ship here we have two examples. People step into leadership positions and they guide people out of disaster. It's not always great. Uh, here's the picture of the Astrodome. And uh, people may have been safe from the floods, but that had its own terribleness to it. People were stuck in the Astrodome. Uh, there was no way to manage so many people, like, take care of all their needs. Um, I don't want to make it sound like it was a war of all against all. I think some of the statements about the Astrodome have turned out to just be panics, but this was not a good picture of people um, in desperate places in a desperate time being able to grow. Um, they were pretty much warehoused in there. Here we have after Irene in Vermont, um, and these could be state workers, but a sense of People are just jumping in, doing what needs to be done. Who cares about class status at this point? Who cares about property under climate change? Uh, it's really just what can we do to minimize uh, the destruction around us and protect life? Here is Oregon from this summer. Um, I see climate change as changing what we think about property. Government for Milton Friedman and other uh, peop uh, people who think about the advantages of democracy for capitalism put property rights as a very high right. Uh, sometimes people would say it's the high, higher than any other right when people are talking about the blessings of liberty. But look at what climate change is doing to property. It's taking it from something that is a mass to something that can be lost. And um, so I wanted to just give you uh, another way to think about this, this project, what I'm suggesting. Um, I'm not the only one to suggest this, but
But uh, the idea that this, as I say, begins with Aristotle. And here, uh, Martha Nussbaum, uh, one of our great American political theorists who relied heavily on Aristotle for a lot of her positions, to be a good human being is to have a kind of openness to the world, an ability to trust uncertain things beyond your own control that can lead you to be shattered in very extreme circumstances for which you are not to blame. Um, so there's this peace, this openness, even in really difficult circumstances. And things are beyond your control, but you're building this muscle inside, this openness. So when I thought about that passage, and, and I'll give you one other from her, um, I was thinking about volunteers. Allison mentioned that in the chat earlier. This is, um, I think, sorry, I can't remember when this one happened. I Oh, here we go, Oregon. So this is after the fires. Uh, people come together, losing everything, want to volunteer. The scale of values has shifted from ownership to helping. An amazing shift in people. Um, here is also Oregon, looking through the fire wreckage, volunteers who come, uh, who try and find what they can for the person who lost everything. That says something very important about the condition of the ethical life that is based on a trust in the uncertain and on a willingness to be exposed. It's based on being more like a plant than like a jewel, something rather fragile, but whose very particular beauty is inseparable from that fragility. So when you guys are talking about plants and gardens, Nussbaum is right with you that this is what we should be thinking about. Um, a willingness to be exposed means that we are seeing ourselves as plants, as that fragile, but also quite beautiful. So something else that I've noticed around climate change, I'm sure you have as well, is uh, planting trees, being in the garden, putting the value of plants uh, as, as front and center. And here's one more. Um, so I actually think climate change is going to be what we need um, in order to become just the sort of persons that Aristotle and Martha Nussbaum says that we can uh, become. It's going, to, it's going to be hard. We'll have to be open. We'll have to be vulnerable and think of ourselves like plants as opposed to clutching our jewels. So I don't know, there's my optimism. We the people under good circumstances didn't always get it right. We became degraded, we became corrupt. But I'm thinking under climate change, we might get it right. So that's what I got. And Okay, plants love CO2, <laughs> it's George Putnam, yes. Meg, thank you. To everyone who's here, I think we can't unmute you. We, we were trying, we're gonna work this out. This is a new platform, it's the webinar version and we're still getting used to it. Um, <clears throat> so I think Meg, we would need someone like you to give us a, be optimistic, be engaged, be a little fragile, don't fall into despair. Pep talk every time we go into having group discussions about any of these tough topics, because if you start by being a little more disarmed, that's mm -hmm. a helpful, it's a, it's a help, at least to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Bob, thanks for saying that. And since you're in a library, I, I always make a plug for this book, which just came out, High Conflict, Amanda Ripley. And what she studies is uh, conflicts that people are stuck in. The subtitle is why we get trapped and how we get out. So she has some evidence. But what you said, Bob, is absolutely right. The best thing you can do in a really tough situation is try this out for a sentence to, to somebody you don't agree with. 
you may be right. Let's give it a try. And all of a sudden things change. Uh, so let me put this book in chat. Let's see, am I able to do this to send chat to everyone? And it is Amanda Ripley. Published this year. She even talked to Congress. Uh, there's some committee in Congress. It's called the um, Committee on the Improvement of Congress. They brought in Amanda Ripley, um, some of the people with Braver Angels, if you know that uh, network. And they basically sat down with this committee of senator, I'm sorry, uh, representatives, um, Republicans and Democrats, and thought about what are the specific ways you can depolarize conversations in Congress. Give it a try. <laughs> Ryan, would you like to say anything before we leave? I, I don't believe so. I was just um, really grateful for, for Meg's talk. And I do want to put a plug in for, uh, we'll be having more of a freewheeling discussion uh, around these, these topics as part of our fall conference. Uh, this will be Wednesday night. It would be the, is that right, Meg? Let me just look at the calendar really quickly. I believe that is. Let's see. Yes, Wednesday the 20th at 7 p.m. Um, and if you're on our email list, you will, um, let me start my video, you will uh, be notified about this. Um, and so we'll be starting with the lecture that Meg gave this evening and then open it up for wider, wider conversation. Uh, and I think myself and our executive director, uh, Christopher, will be um, dialoguing. Uh, with Meg as part of our con our uh, fall conference about climate change. Great, great. Well, thank you so much to Vermont Humanities Council and to Bob and Athenaeum uh, for inviting me. And uh, because really, I'll tell you, I've been working on this for the last month and I kept reaching an impasse. And I thought, I'm just going to have to tell people that no, we're not able to do this. Uh, so anyway, it, it always reaches a moment where I feel like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's another possibility. I go back to my old guys and find uh, find uh, hope. Yes. OK. And it looks like um, that next event has been put into the uh, chat. So you can find that there. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, everyone.